Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the industry preseason update um, for the aggregate uh, industry. Uh, I'm Calvin Lee, uh, the executive director of IMAA, Indiana Mineral Aggregates Association. And it's my duty today to welcome you all uh, to the program. Uh, this is our second go around, I guess, of doing this virtually. Uh, we much rather be in person, but you know how it is, circumstances uh, dictate what we do. Um, in fact, you know, it has been somewhat of a challenging year for all of us last year, 2020, and now we're moving um, steadily into our activities for 2021. But I'm happy to report that IMAA uh, met those challenges head on. Uh, we pivoted, you know, from our normal in-person events, um, including our CAP school, winter workshops, operations seminar, safety training, and even this program. And we pivoted to uh, have very successful virtual programs uh, with uh, all of those topics. Um, those who participated, um, thank you for your involvement. Uh, it's been a great success and we feel good about you know, what we've done up until this point uh, is carrying us over until we can get back together um, in person. Uh, also, you know, happy to be aware of our members' success um, navigating their way through this COVID environment and their ability and their achievements of keeping their team members safe and healthy. Uh, we've been uh, you know, in direct contact with lots of our members, especially through our safety committees and learning all the things that they have done uh, to uh, keep their, their people safe. And I think that's been a success and they should be uh, commended for that as well. Um, as we look forward uh, to this construction season, uh, we continue to monitor at the federal and state levels. Um, all indications are that NDOT's construction budget is healthy and it's intact and the future looks bright. So that is good news. And there's some things coming down the pipe that might, we may be able, able to say that even beyond uh, this construction season. So uh, we're, we're happy about that. And finally, in my introduction, um, I, I wanna share with you that uh, from an IMAA perspective, uh, we're proud of our latest efforts uh, to improve or enhance the image of the aggregate industry. You know, the aggregate industry has been looked upon as being a very simple industry. Um, you know, we, we have launched a campaign that is designed to refocus the view of our industry from a dusty, dirty industry who simply breaks big rocks and down into little rocks. Um, there's way more to our industry uh, than that. And we want people to know that. Uh, you know, our industry is essential. And uh, we want folks at state and federal levels to recognize uh, that this is an industry where good careers can be achieved. Um, we have folks who have been in this industry for a long time and have done well for their families. Uh, there's all kinds of careers that can be considered uh, in this industry. And our campaign is exactly designed to, to do that. Uh, the campaign will be comprised of various medias to get that message out. Uh, but the first thing that we have achieved is a video that explains this very well. And uh, I, 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 I'd like to share uh, that video with you today. Uh, I know that some of you attended the winter workshops and had a chance to see this video for, for the first time, but I guarantee you, you missed a few things the first time. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to 
uh, show this short film uh, to you. Uh, and so uh, please enjoy it. Welcome to the crossroads of America. Welcome to Indiana. A busy mom hauling a few kids to soccer or dance. It may not be what you have in mind when you hear the word crossroads, but think about it. These young people and the places they go represent the future of Indiana. Today, they ride. Tomorrow, they will drive on the crossroads of our state. Before they even get their learner's permit, they will log 3,744 miles just to and from practice over three years. Add in trips to and from school, drives to grandma and grandpa's, church or shopping. Now, consider the number of kids that play youth sports in this state. We literally meet each other coming and going on the crossroads of our daily lives, which makes the roads and bridges of Indiana some of our most important assets. This is where it starts. Most people don't think about our roads when they pass one of the 240 rock quarries or sand and gravel operations in our state. They may not understand why these locations matter or what a critical resource they provide to construct highways and bridges. Airport runways, homes and hospitals. They even supply critical minerals to the agricultural and energy industries critical link in the chain that provides food for your family and power to turn on the lights. Here's an interesting fact. Indiana is blessed with some of the best rock resources in the United States. That stone, also known as aggregate, is what comprises a large part of the highway you're driving on and makes your ride so smooth, safe, and satisfying in the first place. From mining to processing to engineering, manufacturing, sales, and service, the Indiana aggregate industry employs over 3,203 people in our state alone. It is an industry where jobs are plenteous, wages and benefits are excellent, and opportunities are almost unlimited. The aggregate industry is a supporter of families, ingenuity, and progressive safety practices. People who start in this industry have a tendency to stay, but it's also an industry where technology continues to evolve and expand. Every day, some of the brightest engineering minds in Indiana are working to turn that 20-year road into a 50-year road, resulting in greater value to taxpayers. Construction engineers are designing safer roads using aggregate that can better withstand Indiana summers and winters. Aggregate is also engineered specifically for applications such as building homes and hospitals and preparing sites for new development. And they do so by constantly making new connections between technology and our natural resources. And who benefits? Well, the people of our beautiful state. And of course, those who are just passing through. Who's not for leaving a good impression? Through the years, the Indiana mining industry has also taken on the role of conservationists. The resources that help build our roads must come from the ground. Rock is extracted before being processed and sized. The material is then railed, trucked, or shipped. This is just a fact. The question is, what happens next? Many retired quarries, as well as sand and gravel operations, become lakes used for fishing and camping. Some have even been transitioned into state parks. Even more, in conjunction with their local communities, become popular recreational areas and, you guessed it, soccer fields. Why is that important? Because our employees live here too. And, like you, many of them have kids who play sports and go see their relatives across the state. Many go to church, and they all go to school, and dream of one day driving across these crossroads of America. All right, thank you, Katie and Calvin. I'm going to try to start my presentation here. Give me a second. <clears throat> all right, welcome, everybody. Uh, as Calvin said, unfortunately, we're here again virtually um, after uh, last year is about this time. It was about a week earlier, I think. And of course, uh, yeah, it was a really weird time. And I don't suppose it, 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 it's gotten slightly less weird since then, um, but it's still weird. I know uh, when I talked to you all in this, this particular meeting last year, I, uh, I, as well as many others, were sure that we'd be 
uh, back to normal, you know, within, uh, you know, probably about a month and a half, maybe two months, uh, you know, three months top sort of thing. And here we are a year later. Um, <clears throat> but I think we're getting a lot closer maybe to being back to normal. And uh, so maybe we'll be able to see each other all again in person at some of these meetings uh, pretty soon. So I have uh, some aggregate updates uh, we're going to talk about. And uh, let's see if I can actually advance my slides here. There we go. Um, all right. So here's kind of an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we have, uh, a, well, first off, a name change. If you noticed, I had gotten used to calling us Office of Materials Management or OMM for the past 15 years or so. We've gone gone back to the future on that one. I uh, have some I, a few minor ITM changes, uh, changes to the way the sun calls look uh, that we send out, uh, polish resistant aggregate. Uh, updates or planned updates, a brief overview of CAP School, uh, changes to the P gravel spec, and I'd like to spend some time uh, talking about probably the biggest topic uh, we've had here in a few years, um, which is uh, the tarantula curve uh, changes. All right, so as I mentioned, we've been Office Materials Management uh, at NDOT. Um, there, the, the, the facility on the east side of Indy and the group were both Office of Materials Management. Um, we've been you know, it's kind of bugged us, a few of us, for a few years. It doesn't really say what we do. It sounds like we, we manage the purchasing of salt or something, maybe, you know. Um, and uh, it, that name was stolen from Ohio anyway, for those of you that don't, don't know. And uh, about 2006 or so, NDOT restructured and, and modeled ourselves after Ohio and took all the names with it. So um, all the, a lot of the signs outside the building still said the vision and materials and tests. And uh, we think it's, it, it explains what we do a lot, a lot better. So um, we uh, manage, uh, not manage, we do the vision of materials and we also test things. And, and uh, so we're changing back to that and we'll be updating various documents that need to be updated throughout the year, as well as uh, in the new spec book, uh, the 2022 spec book, which will be coming out uh, here in a couple of months. All right, um, so some changes to ITM. Uh, ITM 902, we actually had a couple of changes over the past year or so. Uh, this, the first one I may have talked about already last year at this meeting, but I'm gonna talk about it again. And that's the, uh, the use of the go, no-go gauge. And uh, re just recently we made the change to add a, a quarter inch SIG requirement. So, um, uh, so essentially uh, the, the, the go, no-go gauge is now allowable uh, for use for measuring sieves. And uh, the only requirement is that you develop a procedure, uh, you, a producer, uh, develop a procedure, insert that into your quality control plan. Um, we now also have uh, tolerances in there for the quarter inch sieve uh, because there was some concern. It was getting confused with the number four sieve, which is a different sieve. Um, but I think some technicians were looking at the, the ITM and, and, uh, and uh, confusing the two. So that's in there now. Uh, we have some plan changes uh, proposed. Uh, we had not made them yet, but to ITM 203 and 211 regarding inactive status. Uh, the top paragraph you see there is what's there currently. Um, the second paragraph is uh, is the proposed uh, in, the, in the ITM. And really the difference is instead of producers requesting it, uh, yeah, a producer can still request it. Um, however, we can also, uh, if for a, it says there, if a, for a duration of three years, the producer is not produced or shipped any uh, material requiring production or loadout testing, then we can notify, we can, uh, we being NDOT can place the source in, in active status uh, kind of automatically. So that's a proposed change. Um, you could probably need to hear back from uh, if there's any comments uh, from, uh, from anyone from the industry, NDOT districts, whatever. Uh, and we'll we'll make that change. <clears throat> okay. Um, so some quals. Uh, the, the 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 format for some quals or the I guess the, the official title, the summary of production quality letter. Um, it's not really a, a it's not really been much of a letter. It's been a, a formatted uh, spreadsheet. Um, the format has been the same since you know uh, before time began, right? Uh, the '60s, or I think back when it was on typewriters and maybe even before the 60s, I don't know, but we only have only have the files back to then. Um, and so it's been in the same format and everyone's gotten used to it. But what it did require is it required transferring data manually from the test reports uh, onto that form, the SunQual form that is being typed out. 
uh, for a variety of reasons, including uh, freezer being down, um, changes in the way we're doing some things. We had fallen behind on getting those sum calls out. Um, and so kind of both to, to, to both uh, improve uh, the, the, you know, it, it, problems we had with transposing data and also getting ourselves uh, back uh, on a good schedule, uh, we proposed a new format to the sum calls we rolled out around the beginning of 2021. Helps us get the letters out more quickly, reducing those transposing errors. Um, and we now have a cover letter and attaching the actual test reports from our database system called SiteGrader. Uh, our plan is, uh, at once we've gotten this uh, uh, rolled out, uh, our metric is now going to be having the, the sum call letter uh, package out within three weeks of completing all of the test results from that source. So it typically would take us, we go out and get a series of quality samples um, it would take in about a, a, you know, two to three months to run all the tests. I mean, that's fairly typical. We'd like to get those out then uh, within three weeks after the final test result from that source being done on that particular round of samples. Uh, so this is an example of what uh, the cover letter looks like. And so I've, you know, obviously blacked out the source, et cetera, um, but it'll be, you know, summary production quality results letter. And uh, we just saying testing is complete and the results are attached. And, um, it, you know, in this case, a list of products, they have a few here. And uh, then on to a description, uh, uh, you know, in the paragraph down there. And uh, here's what an example of the test result report looks like. Um, so it's got our various tests that we run. And this is just a report directly out of Site Manager. And uh, so we'll attach this to the, um, to the, the package. And so if you're a smaller source, uh, you might only get, you know, a few pages, a larger source will get a, a whole bunch of pages. Um, but this is again, all in an effort to get you the, the information uh, more quickly. I, I'll, I'll just uh, say briefly, uh, we, have, we have plans or perhaps at this point, just an idea to develop a uh, online cloud-based system. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with uh, HMA Pay Wizard, uh, we've done that for where we share the Hotmix Asphalt results uh, through a system with the asphalt contractors. They can log in, see their results in, in, in real time, right, as soon as the results are done. Um, I don't exactly know how that would work for aggregate, but I think we'd like to move towards developing a system like that where um, we'd have a portal rather than relying on, you know, emailing things back and forth. So that'll be something we're talking about probably working on over the next uh, number of years. Uh, it takes that long to develop some of those systems, but uh, I do think we can get there and, and modernize uh, a lot of this stuff. All right, <clears throat> changes to the ITM 214, which is our polish resistant aggregate program. So currently, um, for those of you, just a, you know, a bit of background, uh, certain categories of hot mix asphalt surface mixtures require uh, uh, aggregates that are various levels of uh, have friction resistance. You know, the highest level we require um, either a, a slag or a sandstone to be blended uh, or uh, something that was approved via ITM 221, what we call a high friction aggregate. Uh, thus, for our highest category roads, for a medium category, we require either a, a, a dolomite. And at some point in, uh, in DOCS history, uh, we, we started to have this program for non-dolomitic material, ITM 214, to get approved. What we do and what we have done for all those years is we initially run British polishing uh, testing and the British pendulum uh, to validate uh, compared to a known source and then have a two year test trip or more. We actually added now a third year uh, into the program a couple of years ago in case it doesn't pass the initial two years. So that's time consuming and costly, obviously from inception to the finish line, you're talking more than two years uh, and it costs a lot of money for those of you that have done it, what I've been told uh, there's a pretty big expense in you know providing the material. A uh, mix contractor has to do a, another mix design for the asphalt and and all the various placement things. Uh, so a few years ago, ITM 221, uh, which I mentioned a few seconds ago, was developed as a way to uh, validate friction on uh, as a the, the, the it was a research project that was looking at using other materials other than slag and sandstone. Uh, that could be equivalent to those materials for our high volume surfaces. So um, this method was developed. It uses a three wheel polisher. Um, if you see, I stole this slide from my, so it wasn't Wednesday. I stole this slide from 
the uh, the presentation I gave to the IMA winter workshop. Uh, so about a month ago, Aisha gave a presentation on this. Um, there's a, a device called a three row polisher and a, we put some asphalt samples under there, an anemic friction tester that measures it after polishing. And um, it gives us uh, what we feel like are good results. Um, so, uh, and have uh, we've validated that through research. Uh, so our plan is to utilize that method to replace the ITM 214 system of a British pendulum and uh, tester. So what else do we need? We need data. Uh, we're currently piloting a set of samples uh, with US aggregates and milestone. Um, and one of the samples, we're, we're, that, that there's a couple of uh, uh, aggregate samples that they're attempting to get approved as a PRA. Uh, and also we, we've asked if they provide a highly polishing aggregate because we have not done that yet. That's one of the things we, we're missing. We've, uh, if we're trying to approve aggregates, we think are friction resistant, polish resistant, or if not friction resistant, have good friction, I should say. Uh, we tend to test those. We it didn't really hadn't really occurred to us yet, or hadn't just gotten around to doing it yet to test something that we think is going to perform poorly. Uh, so we are doing that. I feel like we need that data to offset to make sure we're distinguishing well between poor performing and, and good performing aggregates. Uh, we're going to follow up on some of the long-term friction locations from some of the early samples we did with this method and then hopefully have this fully in place for 2022. So we're gathering some data and working on this over the course of the year. All right, CAP School um, was held virtually back in uh, December. And uh, that was not, you know, it was one of those things we, as with everything else, we try to wait to the last minute to make that call. And uh, we ended up um, deciding that and it was, you know, I think the right decision versus having a in-person school with 60 people in a room, uh, which is not, not, not very feasible uh, with, with, this, with, with the circumstances. Um, a lot of challenges with that that had to be overcome, the implementation of a, uh, a system that could handle that. Um, there are a lot of people involved that did a lot of work, so thank you to them. Uh, we were, had a plan to deliver the, still deliver the exam in person uh, on you know, the, the last morning of the class. Uh, at a few sites around the state. Um, we ended up discussing that and decided that just because of, you know, at the time, all the COVID protocols and uh, we delivered the exam virtually as well. Uh, because of this, uh, we're gonna need to rewrite the, the test questions, whether or not it's just reorganizing, uh, changing some answers, I don't know. Um, we'd like to hope nobody kept a copy of it, but at the end of the day, it's it's now out there um, to the, to those. and so. We're going to do that over the course of the year, uh, rearrange the test questions. Uh, we had pretty good, uh, you know, results. We had, we had one person didn't take the exam. Um, we had a few that failed on the first go around and on the retake, uh, we had one person that did not pass. So all but one passed the exam, um, pretty good. Uh, I think our takeaway, there are some questions over whether or not we would maybe go to a virtual CAP school for the, for in the future. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to speak for everyone. I, I think we there is a value to this type of training in person, the interaction, uh, uh, having the help, uh, things like that. Um, I, you know, I, I, the, the, the plan at this point, what we're looking at is uh, for the next CAP school, uh, most likely this November again, I will be back to in person. So um, now it doesn't mean we can't, uh, it ha we've had, has, have had some discussion whether we could develop what we used, uh, what we did into an on-demand type of module uh, for those that maybe can't make it to CAP school for one reason or another. Uh, so we are having those discussions and is that something we can uh, we can build out of, out of this? Okay, um, the uh, CAP technician. So for a lot of years, we did not have, um, uh, or, or if, if you wanted to find out if you're actually CAP certified, you had to ask somebody from NDOT. We didn't publish it. Uh, we talked to, to in, you know, talk to industry, other states do it, and the sky didn't fall. So we started doing that. Uh, last year, it's now online under the uh, materials, materials and test page. And uh, hold on a second. Apparently, my headphones are about dead, so I'm going to have to unplug. All right, sorry for the technical difficulties there. Um, I, uh, I think I can do it this way though. All right. 
So uh, one, one thing we added uh, recently was on the column on the right, you see there IA qualified. Um, that is an indication of whether or not that particular technician is, uh, is also qualified via the IA program uh, currently. Um, so if you log on and want to find out if you're certified, if you're currently, uh, if NDOT is viewing you as up to date, um, if you're not on there and you think you should be, you know, talk to us. Um, and uh, the recertification procedure, we started this last year. So for many years, uh, for those of you that have been certified for quite a while, um, again, I stole this, stole this slide. I needed to go through and make sure. I, I went through and took out slides that I wanted to, but I didn't uh, edit all the text. So, um, so anyway, uh, last year we started this recertification process. Uh, we've been doing this regional meeting for eh, four or five years. Uh, we thought it would be a good way to recertify folks rather than having the three years of proficiencies as we used to. Uh, that was predicated on going to the every two year cycle for IA. So we did it again this year. Um, that's why a lot of you are here. Um, and for those of you that didn't, as Katie said, there's also the, um, the uh, recording. So if you're watching the recording later, then yeah, congratulations. Hope it's a sunny day instead of a rainy day. All right, uh, pea gravel. Um, we previously didn't really have a defined material classified as pea gravel. We had in our specifications, this was in our section for our impact attenuators, those yellow uh, barrels you see on the highways uh, near bridges, et cetera. Um, that was really the only place we, we referenced or had something about pea gravel. And uh, there was a desire from uh, the people that deal with those to uh, kind of have a more specific specification uh, rather than what you saw there uh, that's in, uh, uh, struck out in this in this section here. Um, and so we developed a new size called 93, we called it 93 PG, oops. And uh, you can see it there on the right. Um, if, you, if you can read this, this will be in the, uh, the upcoming spec book. Uh, this could also be found on the changes, um, some of our spec changes on that we uh, show online. And for those of you that didn't see it, uh, Jim Rauman gave a, a presentation on navigating our website. So if you wanna find those um, and you watch that presentation, hopefully you learned a lot about how to find some of these changes that we make. So um, th the way we developed this was just looked at a lot of various pea gravel uh, gradations around the state and uh, tried to have a, a inclusive uh, specification that also gave us what we were looking for. So. Uh, that is now the requirement for uh, the, those impact attenuators and other areas we might be using pea gravel. I wanted to just mention this because uh, I didn't think I had shared it uh, with everyone, but the new freezer is uh, that we, we got them a couple of years ago now. So it's fully operational. Um, we were still maintaining the old freezer for a while to gather data and just to make sure we didn't have any problems. And what you see there is a handful of 12, 15 points or so, I think, um, of data points where we actually did side-by-side -side testing uh, from the old freezer, which is in orange, and the new freezer in blue. We had a problem, as you can see there, at the time with the old freezer with a timing issue. We corrected it, and actually we're pretty happy with the comparison we're getting. Um, and uh, so we're not making any, any changes to the spec limits uh, going forward. You can see actually the new freezer is a little... Um, tends to be lower there in this expansion measurement. So it, uh, I guess, slightly benefits the industry by a, a 0.05 or so, uh, which, uh, 005, sorry, uh, which is, uh, we're, we're viewing as negligible, uh, but encouraging comparisons. All right, so my final uh, large topic here um, is uh, tarantula. And so a lot of you maybe even wanted to come on today to, to see about tarantula. Um, and our, our changes that we've made and, and are working, um, working towards on uh, optimized concrete aggregate. So what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to improve concrete performance. And uh, this tarantula curve uh, is, is, uh, was developed by some research at Oklahoma State University uh, to do just that. Uh, so as I mentioned, it was developed at Oklahoma State uh, about a decade ago or so. And it was a way to proportion the aggregate to improve workability for, for in, in a concrete mix. Um, so for many years, uh, asphalt uh, through VMA, uh, maybe a similar uh, kind of parallel concept has optimized the aggregate, um, whereas as opposed to having a single size aggregate or maybe two sizes of aggregate, you have multiple sizes that fit together 
um, instead of, again, single sized, uh, uh, you, you, we want to get maybe towards well graded. Um, the goal ultimately was to minimize paste content, um, but it also turns out it improves durability and improves workability. Um, and I'm not going to get, I'm not a concrete researcher, but there's a lot out there about the benefits of, of minimizing the paste content um, on top of just saving money on the expense on cement. Um, and what I've told everybody is, hey, this means more aggregate and concrete ultimately. But um, that was what the research was focused on. What we're focused on is really just the performance and uh, durability of the concrete at, at this point. So there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of various concrete problems that uh, this that this uh, can can improve, and uh, workability is one of them. Um, you know, if if you have a non uh, non optimally graded mix, difficult to place and finish. I, I stole some of these slides from Mike Nelson, and I don't know where he got this photo, but I I, I like it. You know, in front of a, I think it's a Petco or something there, doing the sidewalk and uh, you know having to go to a lot of lengths to finish the concrete there. Um, talking about uh, paving concrete. Um, this was an example. And so this was one of the things, there's some others, but this was a big one. Uh, the photo you see there and the gradation shown, and I'll get into what that, uh, um, that gradation or not that gradation, but the, the curve itself in a little while. Um, but that particular core came from a, an actual project uh, on, on a, a very high profile project in, in NDOT. Um, and uh, those are, it's a fairly pervasive. We had a lot of cores like that. We've done some other, uh, you know, look, it, it, um, work into this. And it was, uh, we, we've determined it was directly uh, resulting and having this gradation. Um, if we had had a gradation that met tarantula, we most likely would not have had these problems uh, would not, with poor consolidation uh, behind the paver, um, segregation, things like that, that led to these voids in the concrete. Now, this is another real world example of uh, what you're looking at here is a, a, a concrete uh, a barrier wall and a, a core kind of horizontally through it. And you can see the rebar in there and there is a crack. Um, but uh, if you look kind of below the rebar, there is a, there is a void. Um, and uh, the mix in this case, again, not optimized, doesn't like to, to consolidate uh, when it's poured in into the form below the, uh, the steel there and, uh, you know, leading to cracking, leading to poor performance. So, um, there's many other examples uh, of that, but those are what we're trying to address. Um, there's you know other issues with uh, strength that can improve strength, uh, shrinkage cracking, scaling, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're trying to do. So are we getting bad concrete? That's, that's another statement we've had as well. Are you saying we've been getting a lot of bad concrete? Well, no, we're getting some, you know, we're, we're getting, we're not all the concrete is bad. I showed you a couple examples there of concrete that was less than ideal but we could be getting better concrete everywhere, uh, both pavement and structural concrete and uh, pretty much everything we do. So it sounds, um, if, if that's all you hear and you see a gradation, you say, that sounds simple enough, just require that gradation and let's do it. That's been the hard part. Uh, so back in, I'll do a little timeline here. Uh, back in 2017, just about four years ago now, we proposed uh, to the various industry groups uh, just a, a requirement that we uh, all mixes meet tarantula gradation. Uh, for concrete pavement, we actually had one uh, circulating around for structural concrete also. And uh, we it kicked off a lot of discussion. For those of you that remember or might have been around, um, we, we had meetings and, and exchanged a lot of uh, correspondence on the topic. How is industry going to deliver this? How is the ag industry? How is the concrete industry going to deliver what we're asking for? and uh, who's gonna be responsible for making any kind of changes required to meet it. So we marched on with having discussions, how do we do this? What are we, you know, maybe looking at some other states that had done it already and, um, and, and we still really didn't come up with a great answer uh, until it was, uh, you know, around the middle of 2019, a couple of years ago, we got talking about the, the gradation on the eights. So, uh, if you know in standard Indiana eights, um, what we found was most of the eights that we're getting don't typically meet the tarantula gradation when you blend it with a 23 sand. So, you know, the standard eights and 23 blend that we require currently in the spec doesn't meet tarantula. And so, we're asking, well, why do we actually want the eights? You know, we're saying, yeah, make concrete out of eights and 23s, and then we're turning around saying that's giving us not optimized concrete. 
So what do I mean? Well, we're telling you aggregate suppliers uh, and aggregate industries through the CAP program, if you make eights and stay within, you know, all the tenants of that program, you're doing a great job. And then we're turning around and we're talking about telling the concrete producers to not use those eights because we're not giving us optimized mixes. So we kind of had one of those moments of this, this might be something, you know, we need to address this part of the problem. Uh, so uh, my office, we asked uh, industry, um, actually really the concrete industry initially to propose a new gradation said, well, okay, if eights aren't going to work, is there a gradation that, that will work? And so the industry proposed a new gradation uh, in the uh, fall of 2019. Um, it's been dubbed recent since then the, uh, the, the ARMCA gradation after the Indiana Writing Mix Association. But um, we had a, 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 at that point a number of meetings, discussions uh, about, about that proposal. So we, we ended up determining and, and you know, coming to a consensus that having that one gradation that was proposed was too restrictive. Uh, it would cause too much, uh, maybe it wasn't even doable in a lot of locations. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, we said, well, what now? Um, what do we do? Do we go back to where we were in 2017 and really change nothing in the aggregate specs and just put, put something in our specifications that says, okay, um, you know, we're, we're the owner, um, you know, we're asking our, our contractors and suppliers and everybody to work together um, to, to, to improve it. And we really didn't feel like that was getting us anywhere. It wouldn't solve anything. We'd be back in the same spot we were uh, a few years before where each industry would be expecting the other one maybe to, to um, you know, bear brunt of changes and things like that. So, we still felt the need to start end up starting from a better place with a, a differing gradation than the current eights we had. So what we ended up talking about was similar to what we did a few years ago for ITM 225 for drainage layers. And for those of you that don't remember, at the time, uh, our pavement group was looking at using 43s and some other gradations to use as a drainage layer. And it was brought up to us, well, 43s have a problem with making them on occasion and you get segregation you get you know whatever there's there's problems with those um so we said well what do we want we want a product that is uh, permeable but also is has good stability for paving on top of and so we ended up developing what amounts to performance uh spec where a producer submits a gradation uh a qa gradation and we review it we approve it and then the uh that gradation is controlled uh, throughout production based on that our initial approved gradation. And so that's what we decided to come up with um, for uh, the concrete aggregate program. So the, the producer will submit a gradation um, and uh, we'll review it and approve that. And I'll get to that in a second. So um, our discussion was, okay, when do we want to implement this? And, um, you know, based on what we know about, I showed you a couple of examples. We have others of just poor performing concrete uh, due to not being optimized. Uh, we didn't feel we could delay any much longer and we're going to move. We plan, we decided to move forward with implementation, taking effect with contracts led after 9-1 of, of 21. So the changes we made are replacing eights and our material specifications with uh, what we're calling a concrete course aggregate uh, approved per ITM 226. All concrete will require optimized mixes and then the um, and so the, the concrete producer actually have to show that the mix they're giving us is optimized also. And I'll get to that in a second. Uh, so this is the, the new ITM we created. It is online now. If you go to our website under materials, you can, and, uh, Indiana test methods, you can find the ITM 226. The idea is a producer submits a candidate gradation, um, not the actual product, uh, but just a gradation that you've developed, uh, on paper. Um, we will take that and, uh, and uh, well, you can actually develop the product. I mean, we just don't need physical samples of it. We just need it submitted to us. <laughs> um, the gradation will be evaluated for compliance with the tarantula curve. Uh, there's going to be four different uh, comparisons here. We have two different fine aggregate gradations, um, uh, two blend percentages, either 40 fine aggregate, 60% coarse, and 45-55. Um, and then also on top of tarantula, we compare to these uh, what's called coarse and fine sand limits, um, which I'll show in a second. 
We do have a, a kind of a the similar to ITM 225. We have a, a basic uh, series of, of sieves there. It has to be 100% passing the inch and a half and no more than 90% passing the three quarter inch sieve. So the fine aggregate gradations I mentioned a second ago uh, that we developed in ITM 226, we have a fine, fine aggregate and a coarse fine aggregate. It was based on a review of 76 sands from around the state done last July. And we chose the, um, the fine and the coarse sand by choosing the 15th and 85th percentile of each uh, percent passing each sieve. So these are not actual products. These are, um, I guess, more, more or less theoretical sand gradations uh, based on having something that's fine and coarse with the attempt to try to catch the majority of the state. Um, if we were to choose the finest fine aggregate and the coarsest fine aggregate available, um, then there really isn't a gradation that would pass. And that's kind of where the um, having to get the uh, aggregate or the, uh, sorry, the concrete mix design approved for tarantula also comes into play. So uh, this is a tarantula curve. We defined it uh, there in ITM 226. We didn't, haven't defined it anywhere else. And um, you can, that's, that's what it is. It's based on uh, percent retained by volume. Uh, I didn't mention that earlier. It is a little bit different to think about. We're used to thinking of percent passing um, by mass, but it is based on percent retained by volume, uh, which if you know anything about HMA, uh, it's very similar to volumetric and, and, and VMA that's used there. It's a, it's a volume-based system, and, and this is similar too. Uh, so this is what it looks like when you take a gradation. The gradation you see there uh, in blue is a proposed gradation, and actually this one I chose on purpose because it is a a real gradation that exists. So I said a lot of the Indiana eights don't pass. Well, some of them do. And this is an example of a real uh, eight gradation from a source um, that has been supplying, uh, a, I think, a similar product for years. Um, and you see those curves over there. Uh, it passes. They all plot within. Um, and so there are some sources that want to change anything. And this is, this is one of them. Um, and uh, but what we have here is another example of another. This is an eight uh, from a different source, and you see there on the half inch sieve, it's way out of out of the uh, tarantula curve, and that tends to be where we see a lot of the the issue maybe with some of the eights that have been uh, around. Is there's just a lot retained on the half inch sieve, and it, it throws it out of being optimized. Uh, this is an example, uh, I believe, of a gravel uh, using a, a gravel eight that we had. Um, a gradation four, and you can see there, it's actually out of the number four sieve. And uh, next we have another gravel product that is just barely out um, there on the half inch sieve, uh, not very far, but we're pretty close. So that's what, so what one uh, gradation is submitted, uh, we will plug it into the spreadsheet and uh, validate whether or not it's going to meet the criteria we laid out in the ITM. Uh, so once the gradation is approved, if it passes uh, both the uh, tarantula and the coarse and fine sand limits, uh, at section eight here in the ITM is what you're looking at. Um, we define the gradation at the time of approval, and that's going to be the established gradation for controls, the quality of the QA material in accordance with ITM 211. The other difference is it's not a critical, we decided not to make it a critical SIF product and uh, have it based, be based on uh, controlled on those seven SIF you see there. Um, different from a Draft or earlier draft version, we had the number 30 sieve. We decided to remove it. And um, we, we did make a change to the eight sieve uh, tolerance there. So in 8.2, you'll see there plus or minus 10% on the uh, sieves number four and above, uh, number plus or minus six on the eight, and plus or minus two on the 200 sieve. And so that'll be what you'll control uh, the product based on. And um, and yeah, that's, that's how it'll work. So we added 8.3. Um, just as a way to, uh, I guess, maybe cover ourselves a little bit from a department perspective is on an ongoing basis, we're going to review what is actually being produced, uh, whether that's via point of use samples or our quality samples or whatever. Um, and uh, we, we've, we've stated if we have multiple gradations uh, consecutively or, you know, a number of gradations in a row that are not complying uh, with the tarantula curve. Um, we, we're going to take some sort of action. So what we don't want to see happen is, is someone submit a gradation that's maybe borderline when we approve it and then maybe produce all the way up, uh, you know, against 
uh, one of the edges. And so we're going to monitor that over time. Um, I don't know how often that'll come up. Uh, that's, that's just one of those things we need to, just like a lot of you, um, we, we can try to theorize how a lot of this will look, but we really won't know until we start getting products submitted and, and start seeing it go through production. So the, the, the back end of it is the concrete producers also have to demonstrate compliance to the tarantial curve under submitting the mix design. And so whether that's through a combination of a certain coarse ag with a certain sand, um, you know, might knock them out. Uh, not uh, just approving VITM 226 is not going to ensure that every mix is, is optimized. It's going to give us a lot better starting place. Um, so sands use, change of gradation, et cetera. Um, and so uh, both, both um, structural and pavement concrete uh, will have to comply with, with that. Uh, I will mention here, uh, we do allow, we, we are allowing the, the blending of an intermediate uh, coarse aggregate, uh, for instance, a pea gravel size or other uh, type of product um, if, uh, if they can't, I mean, because th that's what they have to do, right? If they're choosing a coarse ag and a sand that doesn't meet it, they're going to have to blend another aggregate with that or choose a different sand or, or do something. So that is allowed uh, per the specification there. All right, so the remaining questions is, how does this affect AP testing? Well, uh, at this point, we're not making any changes. Uh, ITM 210 doesn't really, I mean, doesn't use a, a eight gradation. It uses a specific gradation to make those beams for the AP freezer testing. Uh, we have some larger amount of material plus one inch are now allowable. We don't feel that's going to have an adver adverse effect. Uh, and so we're gonna continue with the same gradation uh, that we use instead of sampling an AP8, a now we'll have an APCCA, I guess, um, to, to, to make, to split out uh, for making the beams. Uh, if over time we uh, uncover some new information or do some research or whatever, we may have to modify that approach, but for now that's what we're going to do. Uh, a question we don't have is how often do we update, or we don't have an answer for yet, how often do we update gradations for the concrete producers to use? Um, is that something that they're going to be required to run themselves? Are we going to have a a quarterly update to that, what they're using at their plant, we're not sure yet. How often do, does not going to, or is not going to validate gradation on these products um, through either point of use or, or samples from the source? Um, we don't know yet. And another question, how do we handle the transition into 2022 with carryover projects, meaning projects that were let prior to 9-1 uh, of 21, but have go on into 2022 for construction? Um, and uh, it's probably going to have to be a case-by-case -case basis and whether or not uh, the contractor and the supplier in conjunction want to want to opt into the new aggregates or they want to continue using the old specs for, for whatever reason. Okay, so I have a few just future topics I wanted to let everybody know that we're talking about, and then we'll have hopefully some time for a few questions here. Uh, we would like to, um, I know it's been asked by industry uh, for a number of years, but um, Nair Siddiqui with our geotech group has uh, been talking recently about wanting to go through the uh, section on, on B-bar on structure backfill and kind of clean up some of that language. I say clean up because we have some things in the 200 section and some things in the 900 section, and it can be confusing to know where to go um, to find information on both B-bar and structure backfill, and we'd like to work on some of that. Uh, we do have an ongoing, it's kind of stalled, and one of those things that got stalled due to COVID. Um, but uh, updates to the point of use program um, that, you know, what are we using it for? How often, where are we getting samples? All that kind of thing. Um, so we're going to have a, a small internal group at NDOT to talk about that and what we want to see out of the program. Um, I think we're still looking at audit checklist updates for the 21 season. Those have been distributed. Um, and I think we're looking to get a response back uh, here shortly, if, if we haven't already, on those. Um, we still are working on the alternate 53s proposal. Uh, we need to schedule a small group meeting. Uh, uh, Bob Lingerfeld, I saw your, if you're out there listening, I saw your email. Um, and we just need to pick the, the right people at NDOT to schedule that meeting and we'll look for a time. Uh, concrete aggregate friction. Uh, Mike Nelson, with our, our concrete engineer, has recently been digging into the concept of looking at friction of concrete. We've historically, I hate to say ignored it, but we've ignored it. Um, just because we had tining, we had mechanical way of developing friction. Well, we're doing a lot of looking at grinding. We're looking at uh, 
some other things like that um, that that are uh, you know potentially exposing the aggregate. And so we're running into situations where we have low friction on concrete pavement um, or bridges, and that uh, we need to get a better handle on it. Uh, we've uh, apparently Texas has looked into uh, uh, Texas DOT has looked into fine aggregate in relation to the micro devol value on the fine aggregate and concrete to friction. Um, it's a theory at this point. We really don't know what the uh, we don't know if if uh, PRA or dolomite has as much effect with concrete as it does with HMA. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking into it. Um, there is also ongoing research on blast furnace slag leachate um, that uh, we actually recently just had a, a meeting with that industry to talk about that um, and uh, how it's going. And, you know, ultimately we're, we're looking as a, as a state to find a way to uh, test or validate um, that we are not um, going to have a slag that doesn't leach and, and give us a problem with that leachate. Um, so that is uh, just wrapping up, I think, this summer and hope to have a report uh, later in the summer or into the fall. So that is all I have. And I don't know if we have any questions. I've not been monitoring the chat, uh, but I think we have a little bit of time before the next uh, session for some questions. Actually, I see the window now, so I have a few. Uh, so it looks like uh, Nathan Butts from Laporte in regards to optimized concrete aggregates, will class AP course aggregate still be required in PCCP? Yes, uh, class AP is still required. It just isn't necessarily an eight. It is a, uh, you know, class AP concrete course aggregate, uh, CCA. Um, it's that whatever the QA product is, is being called. Um, with, uh, let's see, anonymous attendee, with problems finishing optimized concrete, would E5 benefit finishing? How about carbon cure? Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, so yes, uh, E5, um, to get too far in the weeds, E5 is developed as a finishing aid. We now allow it um, as to be a memo on certain, uh, on bridge decks at least. Um, it's an admixture uh, for our structural concrete um, and it is, does improve certain things uh, as far as finishing. Um, carbon cure, uh, is again another additive um, being pitched as a way to uh, reduce carbon emissions by injecting the concrete with carbon dioxide. Um, at this point, I, I think we're just you know we we don't know enough about carbon cure. We've we've seen some information um, and maybe some of the uh, based on what we know right now, we're, we're we're still learning about carbon cure. I guess I'll put it that way. So, uh, but it, we do seem to see beneficial uh, results from the E5. Um, Nathan Butts, will number eight still be required for underdrains, PCCP subbate, drainage backfill, et cetera. Um, we, we need to work on those sections and uh, probably allow these gradations as alternates. Um, and Eric uh, Woodings, why is the 200 sieve needed when there's already a spec for decant? Um, well, you know, I guess, so I, I, um, you, I, I guess he means for the, the ITM 226, um, there's a spec on the eights for, for, for decant, um, unless I'm missing something. That may be something we need to address offline. Um, really, the 200 sieve was there. We, I would say we copied it over from the, the gradation for the eights, but we carried it forward, I'll say, uh, from the eights gradation. Um, and if there's some reason why we think we don't need a 200 sieve spec, um, I'd be happy to happy to hear about that. Uh, will producers be given the spreadsheet to plug gradations in to check if their product fits into the curve? Yes. Um, we will be making a version of the spreadsheet available for sharing. Uh, I need to actually check with uh, Mike Nelson to see if that's ready to go live or not. Our plan is to put that um, on the website. Uh, and the same with the concrete mix design form will be developed in the, it is de has been developed in the same way. Uh, why would concrete producers not be responsible for ensuring the combined gradation of the aggregates they're blending in the concrete mixtures during production to ensure the gradation? Uh, they are being, um, so we're asking them to submit it on the mix design as far as uh, validating it through production. Um, really it's a concrete, um, it, it's difficult to validate 
uh, you know, other than you can pull samples from stockpiles, um, but actually taking a sample and uh, in the same way as, as HMA and uh, there's no, no way to extract the, the cement, the paste uh, from the aggregates later, like we have with, with HMA to validate it on a production sample. I know you can wash it, um, you know, you can have a, a plastic sample and, and, and wash it uh, in theory. Um, but that's really it. the best way that we're going to be doing it is stockpile validation. Um, HMA may be required to use these optimized eights. They're certainly allowed to use these optimized eights right now. Um, HMA can use whatever gradation they would like. Um, and uh, so if it just depends on what the, on what the aggregate source will be producing, if they'll still be making other eights for use for like HMA, or if they'll completely switch over to that QA gradation for the concrete aggregate, at which point the HMA could use those materials um, or perhaps a different material. I, I'm not sure. Again, it, it's just, it's up to the producer. All right, we're uh, at about 2.02. We've got a couple minutes over. Um, uh, I'll, I'll take this one last question and then we'll switch over. Will you ever consider changing aggregate name to match surrounding states? Um, so eights, uh, yeah, we, we talked about that. We actually talked about just using 57s. It didn't, uh, uh, which is the uh, ASTM slash ASHTO designation that a lot of people are, are familiar with. Um, we uh, looked at that gradation. It didn't really get us any anywhere different than using the eights we had. Um, we, I don't think we want to call it a 57 if it wasn't really a 57. So we're, we're staying away from using that. Although, as you know, a lot of the gradations that you have might fit into a 57. Um, just depends. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, for those of you that are here for the asphalt session, we're going to begin in just a few minutes. I, uh, um, Katie, if you're, if you're there, I'm not sure how long of a break we want to take, um, but essentially, we're going to take a few minutes, a few minutes break here, come back, um, and we'll, we'll kick it off with uh, Kirsten Fowler and <coughs> uh, with APAI and then Nathan Awad, uh, asphalt engineer. So thank you all. And if you have any questions that uh, didn't get a chance to answer, feel free to reach out to me and uh, feel free to stick around for the asphalt session. If not, uh, stay safe and uh, hope uh, you have a better 2021 than 2020.